Hi everyone and welcome to episode 22 of the Ready for Departure podcast, presented by private pilot Steve Middleton. I'm delighted to be able to welcome a fellow pilot and aircraft co-owner to this episode of the Ready for Departure podcast. So without further ado, let's get started. We'll just have a chat and um, t- talk about airplanes because I love nothing more than talking about airplanes. So um, I shall introduce our guest for this episode, Michael Ike pilot and aircraft owner John Quigley. Hi John, how are you Steve. coping with the coronavirus lockdown? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, how you coping? troubling times, um, finding various ways to uh, keep motivated um, and looking forward to flying again. Dare, dare I ask how long it has been since you've flown? Uh, late January, I think. Yeah. Really? Maybe. Oh my God. Early February. I'd have to refer to my logbook, but it's a while. Uh, last uh, sort he was into Harden. Oh yes, I saw that on your. Uh, I saw the pictures you, you posted of that. I'm very jealous. Um, well, it was you that gave I, me the heads I, up I, on it, actually. So indeed, indeed, that that long runway just just is so inviting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, could have landed across it in a C forty two. So yes, yeah, so you fly C forty two at the moment, and um, and uh, you've just bought one. You've just bought a new one. Uh, nearly new, yeah. Our, our group, which originally uh, came into being in late 2006, um, with its first C-42, uh, which we replaced in 2010. Um, we've been looking to replace this one for the last couple of years, but following Brexit and various other things, the uh, exchange rate, has not been favourable, and we were always a few no. thousand pounds short of replacing it. But we found a very, very low houred uh, C forty two B, which, with a little bit of a contribution from each member, willingly I might add, uh, we yeah. managed to secure that and found a buyer for our old C forty two A. So we managed to get it. Back to base the day before the lockdown, so <laughs> a very few of the members have actually seen it in the in the tin or the plastic or the composite, whatever it's made out. Yep. <laughs> um, but everybody is drooling over it, uh, the photographs of us sat in the hangar at Barton. So uh, I've seen the photographs and and it looks lovely. It does absolutely look absolutely fantastic. I mean. I'm I'm fortunate that I've just bought a share in in a Eurostar and and I have actually flown it just once, <laughs> but I have actually flown not as pilot in command because I wasn't on the insurance at the time, um, but it was a sort of pre-purchase uh, flight, um, so that was the last time that I flew. So it's been it's been a month now since I I flew um, longer as pilot in command, but I suppose I should explain that's that's how we met was was actually through your previous C forty two. Foxtrot Golf. I was a member of the Foxtrot Golf group for almost a year and had some fantastic adventures in that, that aeroplane. Got to some places that I'd never never been before and uh, they were just terrific trips. So tell me about some of the trips that you've had in Foxtrot Golf. Where where have you been? What, what, what are your highlights of flying in, in a group aircraft? My highlights um, in both Foxtrot Golf and uh... Golf Zulu, our previous um, Icarus. My main memory is going to Ireland a couple of times. Oh, really? Uh, and my, both my parents are from Donegal, up in the north west coast. Uh, I couldn't quite make it into Donegal because it's in the Republic and the group, I think you need a Group A medical to fly uh, legitimately. <laughs> Across the border. That's right. But yeah. I have been to Northern Ireland a couple of times, Newtonards and Enniskillen and uh, uh, the Causeway, the Causeway airfield up near um, on the Antrim coast. Spectacular scenery, absolutely spectacular. Wow, wow. So you've flown over water then in, in a single engine aircraft. What's that like? <laughs> um, it's, it's a mindset. I've got some very good friends in and out of uh, our group who have varying degrees of confidence about going over the big blue wobbly stuff 
Um, <laughs> I'm pretty relaxed to it. If I can aim for the local Sea Link ferry or something like that, if something goes wrong, um, yeah, then that's how I rationalise it out in my brain. I think if you're going into the drink, it's half, essentially it's half a day out with the Undertaker. It's not going to end well. <laughs> if you can have come to that realisation or, or that recognition of your own potential mortality, um, I think you'll be all right. Some people can't deal with that. Maybe I'm just a bit blasé uh, and things like that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I flew over... The, the only waters that I've flown over, really, would, would be flying over the Mersey. So, you know, the first time that I flew to Carnarvon, uh, flew down the coast, and, of course, you, 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 leave way, you leave Liverpool behind you and you have to cross a little body of water. It only takes, what, five minutes to, to cross that, but the first time was, was a bit <gasps> heart-in-mouth moment. But, you know... I got a nosebleed the first time I flew over Lee, Lee Flash. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's a thing that experience learns you... Or teaches you, I should say. You can do it if you're if you get a full sense of an old... stitch your training, wear a life preserver if necessary. Um, the good thing now with Navid, such as um, Sky Demon, which I'm a big fan of, um, it gives you a nice blue circle, uh, a land clear circle. So depending on your height, uh, if the donkey quit, it'll give you an idea of where, how how far you can glide sensibly. Uh, and safely. Yes, it does. It does do that. So that, that, yeah, that instills yeah. a little bit more confidence too. I find. There's there's an old saying as well, isn't there, that the aircraft doesn't know it's over water. So I I think the first time I flew, I was worried. But then by the time you're coming back, you're thinking, well, we've done this once. It didn't sound any different. It didn't fly any different. So we'll just carry on. And you know, I've done it a few times since. So you know, not quite. Up... The most difficult one for me ever was the first time um, I went to Ireland. Uh, some people will go up the Cumbrian coast and nip across at Stranra, where it's maybe a 12 mile crossing. Um, but I coasted out at Southport and headed directly for the Isle of Man, Ronald's Way. Now that was a bit disconcerting because you can't actually see the Isle of Man when you coast out at a couple of thousand feet or whatever it was, we were at 3,000 feet potentially. So you're about mid-channel before yeah. you actually see uh, landfall. When you're over the Isle of Man, then it's much closer to the Irish coast. You can see the Irish coast from there. So that's, that gives you a little bit more um, confidence. But yeah, not yeah. coasting out and not seeing where you're heading for, that, yeah, that's, it concentrates the mind. I will, I will do it in the future, but of course these are flights that you can really only do if you've either got your own aircraft or an aircraft that you can take away for a day or a couple of days or a weekend or a week. So you can't really do that when you hire from a, a flying school like I, I did for a long time. Absolutely not. It would be an expensive day out, yeah. That, that's right. So, so let's talk about um, owning an aircraft then. So. Um, obviously, me and you, we don't own aircraft outright because that would be insane. Uh, unless you're a, a very rich person and, and someone who doesn't have to work, then uh, there'd, there'd be no point in owning an aircraft outright. So, you know, we're both part of, of, of groups. And how, how do you find um, being a, a co-owner of an aircraft with a group of other people? What, what's the, the sort of positives and negatives of that? There are positives and negatives. First of all, going back to your other point about um, it'd be an expensive hobby. There's the old saying that if God had meant man to fly, he would have given him more money. So it is. It, it, you can't dispute that it, it's an expensive hobby um, by, by its nature. Same, uh, same as that, uh, people are interested in marine stuff. That's, um, you know, it's also a, a money pit. Um, but it, the, the two, it's a double edged sword being a syndicate or being a grouped aircraft. A, the benefits are that you share the responsibility, primarily the cost, with other people. Um, on the downside, you're sharing an aircraft with a lot of other people. Um, and you have to be respectful of that. You all have to recognise there is a cooperative, you are all on the same side, and you try and accommodate one another. Um, 
I couldn't frankly do it any other way um, because of the nature of my finances. This is this is just about affordable to me at the moment. Yeah, yeah, same for me as well. Yeah, it's the only way I could fly to do. Uh, I'm flying micro lights. I couldn't afford to fly Group A. I started out learning uh, to fly Group A, but I could only afford a lesson once every six weeks, um, and you're never going to learn uh, flying that infrequently. And I think the other thing as well is that um, you you when you join a group, if like I did with your group, with the Foxtrot Golf Group, and actually with Delta X-Ray Group, it's an existing group that's already been established. So actually, somebody else has done all the hard work. Um, I did actually have a go at, at, at establishing a group and buying an aircraft, and um, I think I had three attempts at that and failed on all three attempts. So um, I. I, I don't know, did you join your group uh, or was it already in existence or did you did you create the group? No, the, the, the group was created by uh, the main air CFI, Chris Koppel, was I think the first, possibly second, uh, microlight syndicate on, uh, at Barton. Uh, Chris actually purchased the aircraft and invited uh, 15 of his selected ex-students and current students to become part of um, of this syndicate that she set up, uh, he remained a figurehead whilst he held the last share, while the rest of the group was set up uh, and instigated. I volunteered to be uh, the group secretary. Uh, and two other guys volunteered to a be treasurer and b to be trustee of the assets. Um, now I've been the secretary ever since for that group and now this is a third aircraft in the lifespan of this particular group um, and it's been a learning curve I, I had to go and ask uh, Chris Koppel all the time how should I do this how should I do that and now even after what 2006 13 years um, I've gone to him with queries about how we should do this, or how this, this paperwork and it. it. It's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? You know, I mean, I, I consider myself fortunate that I've joined two well-established groups where most of the kinks have already been worked out. You know, the, the group is functioning very well. Uh, and of course, I hadn't met um, most of the people in the group, both groups, before I actually joined the group and started, you know. Um, so it, it, it is a bit of an unknown, but uh, I've learnt so much about about uh, aircraft ownership, the, the pitfalls as well as the, the positives. You know, um, you you know if you uh, if you bash it, as I will hold my hands up and say, you know, unfortunately that has happened. Then then I am responsible for that, and there's there's a cost incurred. Whereas of course, if there's a problem with a, a flying school aircraft, generally the flying school is going to have to take care of that. And, and if the aircraft doesn't work, if it goes tech, if there's a problem with it, the flying school usually has two or three others that they can roll out and give you one of those instead. Whereas, you know, I only own part of one aircraft and if that aircraft goes tech, then you're grounded. That's right. I only own 6.66% of mine, uh, <laughs> but it depends on the other 92 and a bit percent to be working in perfect harmony as well. As the six percent I own too, they're all integral. You know, I probably own half a spat and a bit of one of the ailerons. I must admit that um, when I I moved from from Foxtrot Golf Group to Delta X Ray, and now I've taken a bigger share. So like you, I had a a, a six percent share of, of a C forty two, and now I have a twenty percent share of a Delta of the Eurostar. I'm I'm feeling a bit more responsible now, whereas before I did feel responsible, but you know, uh, now I'm feeling like, you know, there's gonna be some real pain if there's a problem here, if you know, I'm gonna feel some financial pain here if there's a problem. But uh, it, I'm lucky, it's a it's a good group, it's it's well established and I'm looking forward to taking Delta X ray on just as many adventures, if not more, than I did in, in Foxtrot Golf because, you know, I had some fantastic trips in that, so that was that was great. So I suppose uh, my question for both of us is what what are our ambitions? What 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 have you done so far uh, or what haven't you done so far owning a great owning an aircraft that you would like to do? Where would you like to go? What would you like to do that you haven't done already? I've been planning for the last 10 years to go and do the Scottish Islands. Uh, 
On three occasions we had all mapped out, accommodation, fuel stops, PPR and the weather intervened. It was always over the August bank holiday um, because then and now and ever since I was 15 I worked six days a week. So the only day I have to do any flying is a Sunday generally and that's when most of the rest of the group want to fly to. So to do anything which would involve being away for three or four days like that trip would it took quite a bit of planning. Um, but each time I managed to plan it, and we were doing it in convoy with another couple of aircraft as well. You know, I, I like going on flyouts with other like minded people. You, you can share the experience, can't you? Uh, yeah. But the weather's yeah. intervened on all, every occasion. So, But my next one is to, which was supposed to happen next month, but it ain't going to happen, was <laughs> to do the Normandy battlefields. Uh, and fly down the coast there and visit all the, well, as many of the sites that um, were relevant during that period. There's Omaha Beach, there's an airstrip at Omaha Beach I would like to get into. It's only small, but it's doable for a microlight. But yeah, that's that's my next thing. So by all, by any chance, it's going to be next year now, not this year. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, Overseas trips are definitely on the bucket list, but I think I need to get a bit more experience before I, I want to do that. But like you, I've got relatives in the Scottish Highlands. Um, it would be great to fly up there. Maybe take the, the father-in-law flying over. You know, he's a he's an artist and, and he, he paints all the Scottish Highlands. Um, it would be nice to take him over some of those those, those mountains that he that he's painted. And he's a keen photographer as well, so I know he would enjoy that. Um, but there's just so many airfields around the UK that I've, I've not been to that I want to get to. So there's just, for me, there's there's years of flying, of just flying into, you know. 86 I've got in my <laughs> book now, so yeah. Only another 2,900 to go then or something like that, isn't it? <laughs> Should keep us occupied for a while. You can't yeah, build them yeah. quick enough. So that... <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, you know, there's so many um, museums that that I want to go to that you know, ex RAF bases have museums that I've not been to. So I managed one this year, which was which was Elvington, uh, the Yorkshire Air Museum. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. So I love that trip. In in fact, um, uh, I went with a fellow a fellow my flight pilot in that. Um, so I definitely want to get to some 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 museums and some ex RAF bases. Take my dad flying because I've not really taken him on that many flights. We haven't landed away yet. I haven't even landed away with my with my, my, my parents yet. So uh, just taking them on local flights, you know. It'd be nice to take them for that, that, that uh, you know, that, that 50 quid, that 100 quid coffee and that 100... 100 pound bacon butty, okay. yeah. That's the one, yeah, yeah. So It's nice to see um, some younger people coming into the sport. It's, it tended to be... A bit old fogyish when I first uh, frequented places like Barton. Um, I'm not. I don't think it's become any more affordable, but uh, I think with microlights now, they're really only the only growth sector in general aviation, as far as I can see. Um, you you can't give a share in a spam camp, as we call them, away these days. Um, just yeah. just the annuals on them, because like the the complete annual bill for a microlights. Um, and there's so, like you say, they're, they're such gold places machines now. Uh, they've been around the mm. world in them. Even somebody in, based at Barton uh, in a CT has been to Canada in, in his wow. John Hilton. Um, and he tried to... That's incredible. At least as well, I think. Um, so yeah, they're really good places machines, and it's good to see um, some, as I say, the younger, some younger people getting into the sport, and a few more women as well. There's never been, never been enough uh, women have, I don't know if necessarily felt made welcome, or, or they felt it's available to them. Um, I think they're certainly in the minority, aren't they? I, I mean, when I was tra training, you know, there was sort of. 10 or 12 of us that sort of started at the same time. Um, I remember doing my RT course and there was, I think there was about 10 of us on the RT course and only two of them were women and the rest were all, were all males like, like us, you know. So they are there, um, but they are few and far between. I think as well, I, I think the fact as well that the, there's now, there isn't the, the stepping stone that you could take a, a microlight license and then upgrade it to mm -hmm. a PPL. 
because that doesn't exist at the moment, I think it's turning away a lot of the young yeah. that think that they might go commercial yeah, in, yeah. in the future. They're not going to start with micro lights, whereas in the past, you could start with a micro light and mm. then gen generally progress through. I would like to see that return. I would like to see a way for the CAA to find a way for them to return that path so that, you know, it is expensive. You can start. I do enjoy taking uh, people for their first flight, you know, seeing their reaction when someone flies for the first time. So I, I will actively encourage you, if someone wants to come flying with me, you know, just to see their face. It's, I did that with my great, son. So. Uh, took him flying about 10 years ago. Uh, and it was the first time in many years I can remember impressing him, you know, because it's very hard wasn't it? when you're a parent yeah. and you get to, well, he was in his 20s then, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to make them think, hang about, the old man's not as clapped out as I thought he was. Uh, <laughs> and he was, he was so impressed. It was a, a, the best thing I'd done. I'd, uh, sadly, never got to touch my, my dad flying because he was scared of flying anyway. But um, before he's passed on, and so I never got that opportunity to do that. But made up for it a little bit with my son. Um, I think there's been a few people that I would like to take flying, but they've um, they've said they're afraid of flying, so that's that's not happened. But uh, I'm fortunate. Both my mum and dad. Uh, and my sister have, have flown with me and said they would come again, so I consider that to be a success, you know, and uh, are willing to come away with me a bit further and, and land somewhere for, for lunch maybe, so uh, so that's my plan. It's just other pilots and instructors who don't want to get in with me these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's another thing, isn't it? There's, after this uh, lockdown is all over, there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of pilots that are all going to be clamouring for an instructor to do a check flight, Instructors um, too. All the, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, instructors won't have flown for a while, so they 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 all lost a bit of currency. So it's going to be interesting to see how that figures its figures itself out. Um, yeah, there seems to be a bit of a dispensation very... made for um, a grace period of was it three months or something? Uh, I read for, for ratings that are yeah. due to expire. Yeah. So I I, I can't see us flying before September personally. It might be a bit of a pessimistic outview outlook, but um, I don't think we'll GA will be uh, flying. I, I think if it's that long, I my, I'm fortunate my group doesn't have any rules about as long as you're legally current, you can fly. I mean, I'll be outside my 90 day rule, so I won't be allowed to take a passenger. So in theory, I'll need to fly on my own. But I think if I'm not flying from March until September, I don't think I'd feel comfortable. Um, going that amount of time. The most sensible people would uh, have that same view as well, you know. So it's going to be a queue up to probably somewhere around Glasgow, outside the main air office. Well, that was quite an abrupt ending to the podcast. It was because, unfortunately, the uh, camcorder cut out at the uh, at the end there. So uh, we didn't get to say goodbye to John, but uh, I want to thank you for joining us on another episode of the Ready for Departure podcast and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks very much for watching and for listening. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Ready for Departure podcast. Music was by Josh Woodward and Chris Zabriskie. You can find out more and get in touch at readyfordeparture.uk.